Welcome everyone to the Apex Sunday podcast where myself, Robert Ross and John Dowsett talk about Formula One and MotoGP races. And today, John, we're talking about the first two races of the 2022 season in MotoGP, the Qatar and Mandalika. And of course, we'll start with the very first one, Qatar. Now, you're relatively new to MotoGP, correct? I'm entirely new. Okay. And, and this is my first season watching MotoGP. I'm about as green as they come. Right. Um, I, I'm absolutely adoring it. I've been an F1 fan for over half a century, and now I'm watching MotoGP. And this is reminding me of early days of Formula <laughs> One. You right. know, it's just it's just wonderful. You were into super bikes at one time, were you, or just casually? Way, casually, way back when. Yeah, I used to right. go watch them at most port. Right. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. super bikes you can buy from the store for. A lot of money. <laughs> yes. I imagine there's still some modifications. Uh, probably the tires are different than, you know, your road tires and so forth. OGP is a prototype series, they call it. So the bikes are custom made from the factories. And the big difference here is, although there are independent teams in MotoGP, they don't make their own bikes. Only the major factories make bikes like uh, Honda, Ducati, Suzuki, Aprilia. Yamaha and KTM. Now, so, how is it that that in in now I'm I'm going way ahead of the game, but how is it that the independents can compete? How they can compete? Yes, how can they compete if they've got old uh, technology or they don't or they don't right. have the best kit? So they they refer to it as a satellite teams, I guess, similar to Formula One, right? Where I guess like Williams and maybe the McLaren or Mercedes satellite teams, although, you know, Williams is probably a bit more fit for that. Right. But basically, well, relatively recently, they changed the rules. So basically, you could run an independent team and buy bikes that were one, two, three, or four years old. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the more older they are, the less competitive they are. And if the rules change, there's some issues there. So now you generally only see bikes from independent teams that are at most a year old. During the pandemic, we had a couple of bikes that were two years old. Mm -hmm. And we also have bikes in the independent team that are exact same as the factory, the same year and everything. So it just depends on their budget and how much they're willing to spend and pay for the bikes, basically. Right. right? Okay. So, yeah. And of course, this allows independent teams to do well in the results. <laughs> well, the other something that's a bit different than F1. The other thing that I noticed, and the di the difference between Formula One racing and and this is that um, the talent can put you out front. Yeah, which it used yeah. to be in Formula One racing way back when as well. If you were a super driver, if you were in a class of your own, you could mm -hmm. take inferior kit and put it up on the front row. Um, yeah. and it looks like I'm seeing that in in MotoGP, which is just wonderful. Yeah, it's definitely. I think drivers make a big difference in F1, but it's not as visible and mm -hmm. obvious. And obviously the car has to be at a certain level or, or you're nowhere in Formula One, right? Right. Yeah, in, in MotoGP, there's, there's two things going on here. One, there's the, the rider can definitely make a difference and certain riders in particular are just make a hell of a difference. And the bikes are generally more equal across the board than, than the Formula One cars are so you don't have like massive front runners all the time having said that honda is traditionally the ferrari of moto gp with the biggest uh, bike company in the world although that may be changing and the most success you know historically so forth right. whereas ducati for example only has one championship with uh, casey stoner <laughs> and so they're still and, looking for a second one and aprilia is a is a very well-known bike um yes. and ktm is not and when no. it comes to this Road sort racing. of you're right they're very yeah. good paris did a car uh, there it it's it is kind of impressive also the other major observation i made was mm -hmm. if you make a mistake in car racing and i don't care if it's formula one or it's uh, any form of proper car racing if you make a big mistake you're done you aren't coming back you 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 can't have you know a a five second uh, mistake and then draw it all back and end up finishing the race. Not right. Not unless you have an unbelievable machine. Right. Um. And then that kind of 
takes it out. Whereas in this, some of these writers, my God, they, they, they have the ability to make a mistake. And you can see that they lose three or four places, but they can claw their way back. Very, yeah. very cool. Yeah, and that mm -hmm. is also reminiscent of the old F1 where the cars were yeah. more reliant on the driver and yes. getting the, the tires were the key, I think. And that's the key in MotoGP is keeping your tires throughout the entire race. Obviously, there's no pit stops, there's no fuel stops, so you're limited in fuel. That's why there's less laps than a car race. Right. But there are switches, so if it rains halfway through the race, you can switch your bike to a bike with rain tires and and back back i think they should make to. them change the tires <laughs> right like on a pit stop yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> that would add a fair amount of time and also there's no uh radio to the drive or to the riders so they have to make the decisions to you know do i come in with this rain or do i stay out that right. kind of thing so that uh we'll see if that makes a difference this year in the past you know certain riders mostly mark will come in at the right time and blow away the entire field and the other teams are like holding their boards out trying to scream at the riders like come in change your bike you know? right. but there's no radio so they can't right. tell them offhand and uh that leads me to a quick question uh when you were racing did you have a pit board or yeah the team was too small yeah yeah did you look at it every time or did you forget no. or no no <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> how often did you look at it um it depended, you know, if, if, if it was, if it was something where, you know, it's a tight battle, then absolutely you want to know where your competitors are. And that was the biggest advantage. I didn't have pit stops. So it wasn't for pit stops. It was to say, you know, car number 77 is 1.7 seconds behind then, or whatever it might be. And that's good right. to know. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And did you ever get lost on what laps were left or? Every time. Right. Every time. <laughs> and, 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 and that's okay. Cause you just go all out for the whole race. And when the race is over, you know, it's kind of like an oh damn moment for me every time. Right. And there were sprint races, right? So like, right. They were laps. short. They were, they were short. They were like right. 20 minute races. The other thing that very different in MotoGP is that there's a Q1 and a Q2. There's not three Q sessions. Right. And the how you do in practice determines whether you go directly into the Q2, which is the second session, or if you go into Q1. So if, you, if you're not in the top 10 in practice, then you go to Q1. And the top two drivers in Q1 then move on to Q2, and then the the 12th at the front are, are made then from the grid. So for qualifying for this, for Qatar, there's not too much to say other than there's some riders that you're probably not familiar with because they're just starting. But for instance, Andrea Vizioso, he's driving for riding for the RNF uh, Yamaha team, which is a satellite Yamaha team. Yes. He has a full spec bike his teammate darren binder moved directly from moto 3 jumped over moto 2 directly into moto gp he's got a 2021 yamaha so a one year older bike and dovi is previously a ducati rider and he contested the championship against mark for three years in a row once very close the other two times not so close and he's having a lot of issues switching bikes. And we see this a lot. And it reminds me of F1 and Daniel going to McLaren and having a lot of trouble with the bike. So the other guy that's having a bit of trouble is Mark Marquez because Honda. So Mark got injured a couple of years ago, missed the entire season, came back last season, still recovering from injury. Mm -hmm. And during that time, Honda didn't win a race for his rear off, which is very wow. unusual for Honda. So all the other Honda riders couldn't win in the, on the Honda. They could podium sometimes, but very rarely. I mean, there was some previously that won occasionally, but very, very hard to win on the Honda. It's had a reputation for being a very difficult bike to ride, mm -hmm. but also the fastest, at least in Mark's hands. And Mark 
destroys everyone in that bike. But now they've changed it to be more rear oriented rather than front oriented. And Mark is also saying it's like moving to a new brand and it's a whole new <laughs> new bike and so forth. So right. he has to learn how to adjust to that as well. So uh we did see him in the race and he qualified on the front row in in qualifying, but uh he didn't finish on the podium, which for him is exceedingly rare. <laughs> so mm -hmm. yeah. So We'll just go over uh, the other thing in qualifying is the Suzuki's. Um, so the other th major difference, I don't know if you picked this up, is that some of the bikes have V4s and some of them have inline fours. So the Suzuki and the Yamaha are inline four engines and everyone else is V4s. And traditionally what that's supposed to mean is that the Suzuki's and the Yamaha's have less powerful engines. Uh, Ducati has the most powerful in terms of uh, top end speed and, and acceleration. But this year, Suzuki had the top speed in Qatar. So, you know, that shocked everyone because they've never, ever had the top speed, right? Uh, at least in the last decade or so. So we saw that in qualifying, but uh, they've also had a lot of trouble qualifying well, Suzuki. So they would often have their riders have to go through the race and make their way through the field. So, you know, they, they qualified okay, but they were expected to do much better in the race, but that didn't turn out to be the case. Right. So, all right, we'll move on to the actual race in Qatar. We had a first time winner in Enea Bastianini, who's his second year in the sport. He's a Moto2 world champion, so he has some championship pedigree. They call him the Beast. That's his nickname. You'll find a lot of the uh, riders have nicknames. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and he won on a 2021 Ducati. Uh, last season, he had trouble qualifying. He, had a, he was on a 2019 Ducati last season. Again, because of COVID, they were a couple of years back. And uh, he did do a couple podiums last season, made his way through the field. So people are looking at Ine and thinking that he has a good chance of at least fighting for the championship, if not some more wins this season. Uh, because he, if he can qualify well, he can usually do pretty well. So now did, good to did, see. Did he do that by managing his tire? Yeah, yeah. Because so, it looked like it looked like he was hanging back for a great deal, and then just went jack for bear yeah so that's there's two sort of dominant strategies there's go at the beginning try to get out as much as possible and hope they don't catch you at the end with your tires and then yes. the reverse of that is try to save your tires and, and go from there so traditionally the suzuki's are also known for the being the less wear on the tires but because they have some top speed this season people are skeptical if that's going to be the case uh, if they'll still be easy on the tires. So I guess we'll see. And we saw and the, Brad, sorry. I was just going to say, and, and the Red Bull, Brad Binder came in second and he did much the same, didn't he? Yeah. So KTM, they came in, I think 2017, 2016. Can't remember. They were known for their off road. So they wanted to tackle road racing for motorcycles. They have, Won a couple races or maybe maybe four last season and a few of the season before. Mm -hmm. Before that, they hadn't won any races. And again, unlike F1, when you're a starting team and you don't and you're not doing well, you're not on the podium and so forth, you have what are called concessions. So during their first few years, they could just work on anything they wanted at any time, including the engine and the chassis. So they just work and work and work until they start right. scoring points and getting podiums. Then your concessions go away and your, your testing Brilliant. is reduced and all that kind of stuff. Brilliant. Yeah. So it permits the teams to catch up to a certain degree so that they're not perpetually at the back of the field. <laughs> yes. Right. So Brilliant. That's brilliant. Yeah. I kind of wish F1 would implement something like that. And they may have to if, uh, say, Mercedes engine is completely not good anymore. <laughs> right. They can have four years of that engine being terrible. So 
Yeah. That wouldn't be good. Um, so yeah, we saw Brad make a great start. Cole and Mark made some good starts as well. Uh, Mark did as usual, trying to get by pole and went wide and uh, decided that was enough for him and finished fifth in the race. Uh, Paul has never won a race either. So Honda signed him brand new last year. Before that, he was with KTM actually as their factory rider. But when the Honda Repsol comes or Repsol Honda comes, you're supposed to to take it Jump. just like Ferrari. <laughs> exactly. Right. <laughs> you know, he he did finish on the podium. He didn't do too well last season because the Honda, again, was so difficult to ride. He's saying this year he can steer it with the with the rear end and use the brakes better in the rear and mark's having trouble with that right. uh i kind of understand steering from the rear from a car what about a motorcycle do you understand that yeah i do a little bit um I, I've, I've never raced a motorcycle i've had motorcycles right um and and to rotate a motorcycle is entirely different from a car um this this is I'm known for doing things that are uh, adrenaline seeking activities and motorcycle racing is the one thing that I don't think I could ever have done. Right. It just scares the bloody hell out of me. <laughs> yeah. Everyone I know who's dated a motorcycle racer, they're always saying, oh, he's injured again. He's injured again. Right. It's mm -hmm. like, yeah, the injuries are, you know, that's the other major difference is that, you know, we do see sometimes F1 drivers, breaking their legs and stuff and crashes and so forth. But it's pretty rare, thankfully. Right. In this sport, though, you're exposed, so you know, you're gonna have injuries. I d I don't I don't know the mechanics of how they how how he would be using his rear tire to steer because there are just so many dynamics with that. Um and the leaning too, like you're not used to that, right? Because that lean angle, like 60 degree lean angle is pretty high. I did. I did have some bikes with dual compound. Actually, only one bike with dual compound tire, and and so I did get some pretty severe lean angles. But I was scraping pegs, and, right. and, and so I didn't get anything near what these guys are doing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it's funny that people are still to this day saying motorsports aren't physical. <laughs> yes. Yeah insane ridiculous yeah yes. it's it's very mm -hmm. physical i remember one of our terrible sports casters when uh jock won the athlete of the year for canada back when he was with williams winning the championship mm -hmm. the sports guys well i'd go down the dvp at 120 every day <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah sorry it's not the same so no yeah. no and uh, we had a lot of rookies this year, and uh, they were mm -hmm. at, a, at the back of this race. Uh, Remy Gardner, who's the son of Wayne Gardner, a previous wow. champion from, you've heard of him? Yes. Yeah, I, I remember hearing of him as well. He, fit, he scored a point in 15th, so it's 1 to 15 in, in MotoGP for points. Uh, Darren Binder, uh, Brad's brother, was close, and he finished 16th. Now, yes. there's a lot of brothers. There's the Espargaro brothers, so Aleish and Pole. Aleish for Aprilia, Pole for Honda. Darren for RNF, uh, Yamaha, and Brad for KTM. And the Marquez brothers, Mark for Honda, and uh, Alex for LCR Honda, another uh, satellite team. So the other thing that, uh, I don't know if you noticed this, but the podium ceremony, they only play the riders' anthem and not the the uh, constructors' anthem. Right. Which is a shame because you never hear the Japanese anthem and you'd hear it all the time because... <laughs> you would, wouldn't you? Honda and Yamaha win quite a lot in addition to uh, Ducati so and Suzuki as well. Suzuki Japanese, obviously. For your first race overall, what would you what would you rate this race, and how much did you enjoy it? Uh, I, I I have nothing to base it on, so it's difficult to rate the race as far as looking at previous seasons. I have none of that. Um, mm -hmm. I thoroughly enjoyed it from mm -hmm. start to finish. Unlike Formula One races, where I tend to have a nap in the middle, <laughs> um, and and it was wonderful. So. Uh, I think it was an independent that won the race. Is that correct? Yeah. 
Yeah, Grissini. I mean, that's fantastic. So, so with that, you know, I'd, I'd have to give it probably an eight and a half out of 10 because there's got to right. be more. There's got to be something even better. What about you? Yeah, I'm going to give it a seven. Uh, it, Qatar, traditionally, we've had last corner finishes for this mm-hmm. race. So it was a little less than that this time. Usually it's been Mark and Dovey fighting throughout the entire race and then determining it on the last corner. But still, it was a good race. And Enea Bastianini winning his first race, uh, Paul getting a, a podium for Honda. He got one last year. Brad Binder, he's won races before, and you know that was completely unexpected. KTM was having a little bit of trouble. They were inconsistent last year, but they look pretty good this year. And Enea drives for or rides for Grissini, which is an independent team. Uh, Fausto died of uh, COVID-19. Mm-hmm. One of the people who, I've known a few people have went through it, but uh, most people survived. Some obviously didn't. So yeah, they hadn't won since 2006, that team. So that's quite a long, quite a long mm-hmm. uh, gap there. How about uh, rider of the race? It's the winner. It's yeah. Bastianini. I mean, yeah. my God. I mean, what, what a great ride. And, and he managed it perfectly. And when he did give it the push to go up front, he was flawless. Yes. In my eyes, maybe he wasn't flawless. To me, he good. looked like he was riding flawlessly. Yeah, he's definitely uh, going to be a contender for at least wins this season. I don't know if you noticed, uh, there was a crash between a Promac Ducati rider, Jorge Martin, and Ducati rider, uh, Peko Bagnaia. Uh, Peko lost the front and slid into yes. to Jorge. Uh, they're also race winners. Uh, Peko won a lot of races last year, a lot of yeah. pole positions. So he's in contention, but you know he didn't do too well this year or this race. But uh, for the rider of the race, I'm going to give it to Inea as well with the honorable mention to Aleish Espargaro with Aprilia. So he finished fourth, which is really good. He beat Mark. And Aprilia, a couple of seasons ago, a rider joined them. He's not in the sport anymore. And he got on the bike and said, this is not a MotoGP bike <laughs> because they were not very good at the time. They're, right. It was almost like a super bike kind of thing. And super bikes are great bikes, but they're softer uh, suspension, probably softer engine delivery and so forth. So Aprilia finally decided to build a proper bike. And last year they did well, and this year even better. So honorable mention to Aleish. If you saw MotoGP Unlimited, Aleish is a bit emotional. <laughs> he, can, <laughs> he can freak out during a race weekend and so forth, but yeah. uh, he brings it all back. So I'll give, I'll give it to, uh, to him as a, an honorable mention and to Inea as uh, the rider of the race. All right, so let's move on to Mandalika. So this is their first race in Indonesia for years and years. Uh, Bikes are really big in Asia, I guess, because you can ride them all year long, unlike in our country, right? How often, like how many months were you able to ride your bike when you were when you had a bike that depended on how old I was. Right. Um, right. when I was young, I would do it almost year round. Oh yeah. Um, through the winter. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then, you know, once I, my, I gained a little bit of wisdom. Um, I wouldn't even ride in the city. So it's yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's sort of made to, um, Halloween sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Because when you see, occasionally they'll show shots of the parking lots at these MotoGP races. I've never seen so many motorbikes in my life. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. But, you know, Canada, we, we don't, our seasons are, our winter is longer than our summer, I think. For inclement weather lasts at least half, this, half the year, wouldn't you say? Well, the, the, the difficulty with motorcycles in the spring is gravel on the road. Right. Um, I've seen motorcycles on the road already this year. Um, and I look at them and I just shake my head because yeah. the sand they put on the road for, for, um, 
ice and and uh, snow when you go around a corner and you hit that stuff it's just nasty so no um it's a shorter season yeah yeah i remember wiping out on just a, a road bike not a motorcycle and just gravel going through my forearm and tearing it apart yeah and that's just a road bike so mm-hmm. yeah, but got to be very careful with these things The return to Mandalika, uh, temperatures are very high in Indonesia, and also they had mm-hmm. difficulty with the track surface, so they repaved it. They tested there a few weeks ago. Track surface was coming apart, so they repaved it. It was better, but they still had to shorten the race because the track surface wasn't 100%. So in qualifying, we saw some big names not make it into Q2 right away, so we had Mark. Marquez from Honda, Joanne Muir from Suzuki, Cole from Honda, Dovey from uh, RNF. Uh, so these guys usually make it directly into Q2, but this time mm-hmm. they didn't. Uh, so basically, the Honda drivers or riders in particular and the Suzukis did not like the new tire. So they had a different tire for testing. They brought a new tire for this race. They had to change it because you know they hadn't been there for the first time just a few weeks ago. So now they knew the kind of tire they needed to last the race. But the Hondas in particular and the Suzukis to some degree did not respond to, they never got the heat working in the tire. So mm-hmm. uh, Mark qualified 15th, which is almost unheard of. And it again, reminded me of uh, Lewis having trouble with qualifying at Saudi Arabia. Mm-hmm. If you can't find your setup and you can't trust your tires, you're lost, aren't you? Absolutely, yeah. So that was the reason for that. And then Mark didn't participate at all. You saw the high side that he had. Well, he had four crashes, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Mark's uh, Mark is a push beyond the edge and then find the edge and stay on the edge type of rider instead of ride up to the edge and find it eventually. Right. And so... He's trying to get used to this new bike and he's he's known for his crashes, but usually not during the race, just you know, in practice and so forth. But crashed in qualifying as well. He just he never got he never got in harmony with his bike this weekend right. or of uh, that weekend. And uh he's not making the race this coming week either from uh the concussion in diplopia where he has double vision in one of his eyes. So yeah. Injuries can really affect your season in in MotoGP. In the race... Yeah, what did you think? It was a high grip circuit for a wet race. I loved it. I loved it. I, I mean, it was just phenomenal. It was to watch what those riders were able to do in the wet was mm-hmm. just amazing. You know, it's just, it speaks volumes to whatever compound that they had on those tires. Yeah, this circuit has a reputation for being extra grippy in the wet compared to other circuits. So, mm-hmm. Usually they're over 10 seconds down, but they were about eight seconds down on the dry. Seven, times. yeah. Seven, yeah. So it was really good. We had great starts from Miguel from KTM, and he won the race. Brad mm-hmm. Binder said his ride height device was broken throughout the entire race, so it was just collapsed the entire race. So he, he didn't do too well, but he finished, I think, in eighth. He barreled his brother out of the way towards the end there. What happened Derek, to Jack Miller? Jack Miller. Uh, now, was it this race or the previous one where? I mean, I thought he had it. I, I mean, he went out front and worked his way up and, and then just, just went, slid right back down again. Yeah. Did, it's, he, did he toast his tires? 
well, Jack has a reputation for not the most stellar tire management. Okay. So he's, you know, yeah, he generally right. toasts them up basically. But okay. I mean, I think it was the race be that we just previous, the one in Qatar, his engine mapping was all off. So he'd be going through a corner and the bike would think it was a different corner. So <laughs> it would rip, you know, make you uh, not trust the bike. So I guess, should we have a yeah. quick talk about electronics? Because he parked, he parked in the previous race. Yeah, because it was uh, just like that. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, it's roughly, you were saying roughly 300 horsepower in these beasts. Yes. Yeah, so they need some traction control because without it, they'd just be high-siding all the time. But they can tune it while they're racing, so they can increase it and decrease it. So they have electronics for that. They have an anti-wheelie system to keep the wheel down. Interestingly enough, before they figured out that wheelie slowed you down, they used to think they, they sped you up. So, you know. Is that is that like a traction control system where it reduces the power? Yeah. Yeah. Manages so it detects the, the difference okay. in right. your, your wheel drop down. <clears throat> There's electronics for the engine braking, but I really can't explain that. I know what engine braking is. Uh, you shift down, at least in the car, you shift down a bit higher than you usually would, and then the the gearbox will rush up and slow down, right? No. And what no. what engine what engine braking is is simply not using the clutch and leaving it in a gear that is low enough that the torque is is slowing you down on the on the rear wheel. Right. Uh, my my guess is if they've got electronics to manage that. What it's doing is, is it's reducing the torque that's going to the rear wheel, because I heard somebody talking about that, saying they turned on engine braking, uh, right. so it would reduce the torque, um, which is pretty common um, uh, thing that they have in in motorcycles to reduce compression. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they they also have a ride height device. So I mentioned that. Brad Binder's had broken. So basically they lower it down at the start so that your bike's not going to wheelie as much and you get a better start. And then they can lower it down going into corners so that the the front, sorry, the back end lowers down and you get better traction right. out of that. So but that has to be there's it's not electronic. It's all a hundred percent hydraulics or spring based. So they just have to press a button and and manipulate that. So the other thing that I know is that some riders, just like Schumacher, we discussed, you know, constantly changing things in his cars. Mm -hmm. Some riders are like that too. They're constantly playing with maps and changing torque right. and, and all that kind of stuff. So and so the other big thing about this race was we had Miguel winning for KTM with Fabio Quadrado. Quattarato, uh, who is the last year's champion, didn't do too well in the first race, but he finished on the podium this one. He generally doesn't finish well in rain races, and the Yamahas mm -hmm. don't. But again, the extra grip in this, you know, was really good. The Suzuki's started way back and moved up, but uh, not into the podium places. Mm -hmm. And we saw some big saves, didn't we, when they're <laughs> wiping out on the... Uh, Unbelievable. <laughs> As soon as they hit the rumble strips, it was, yeah, the traction just goes away. I mean, it's you go to a painted surface and there's no grip. Wow. For rating this race, it was a bit of a spectacle, but I, it wasn't, you know, nonstop action. I'm just going to give it a six. What about you? I'm going to give it an eight and a half because I loved the rain. Right, right. I, I can almost guarantee as we go through the season, my numbers are going to drop. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but for this, to watch these guys in the rain, um, it was spectacular for me. Yeah, what do you think of the coverage itself? Like, they seem to go down the field and do a lot of slow-mos and highlights and so forth, don't they? Yes, yes, it's good coverage. Rider of the race. Uh, uh, Quartararo. Is that his Quateraro. name? Quateraro. 
Quattararo. Fabio Quattararo. Yes. Um, I thought he, I thought he had a, a, a wonderful, wonderful race managed through the, the, um, his equipment nicely. And yeah. yeah, I, it was, he was, he was wonderful to watch. Yeah. Fabio is what they call, they call the super remarkable riders the aliens. So Mark is alien number one. Fabio is probably alien number two. <laughs> Because he's definitely outriding all the other Yamaha riders right now. Like mm -hmm. they all say he can do things on that bike that we can't figure out quite yet. Right. His teammate, Frankie Morbidelli, he's really good. He's recovering from a knee injury. So I expect to see better things from him. Uh, the third finish, third place finisher, Johan Zarco, also French, like Fabio, never won a, a MotoGP race. He's a two time Moto2 champion. I expect him to probably win a race this season. He seems pretty comfortable with the 2022 Ducati. So the Promac team has 2022 bikes, unlike Inea, who has the 2021 and his Brasini team. Right. But Promac is independent as well. And they, they won races for the first time last year. So who's your driver? Rider. <laughs> who's, your, who's your rider? Who's your pilot? Uh, I'm going to give it to Miguel, the winner. He's uh, recently he's, hasn't finished a race in a long time. He's had a lot of trouble. He's been up and down. And, but when he gets out front and he's a great front runner, he usually wins the race. So KTM have a lot of uh, riders coming up in their mm -hmm. system, like Pedro Acosta, uh, Remy Gardner, and uh, Raul Fernandez in the Tech Twa team. They're the B team of KTM and MotoGP. They're great riders as well. Pedro Costa is in Moto2 right now. He won the Moto3 championship last season. He was phenomenal. So again, there's a lot of uh, slots that we need for great riders. And in F1, we need better cars for all these great drivers. Uh, really impressed by this new generation of drivers and riders. They're just... It might be this system they come up into where they're coming up from kids basically and being mm -hmm. exposed to the whole thing from the whole thing. What do you think? Probably the case, right? I, I can't speak to MotoGP. I, I, I can I can say when it comes to uh the level of racing in in the early stages now starts at age six for future F one drivers. Yeah. And if you aren't if you aren't racing when you're six, then the odds of you making it to Formula One are virtually nil. <laughs> and even then, even if you're one of the top guys now, if you don't have money, you, your chances are pretty much nil. Yeah, it's, they Bruno Senna's family kept him from racing for years. So he didn't start till he was like fourteen or something. So, you know, like if he had been given the chance throughout the entire time, maybe he'd still be an F one. Right. Right. In MotoGP, they have like talent cups. So they have the uh, one in England, one in Asia. They've done one in the States now. They're trying to mm -hmm. get riders that way. So, and in Spain, obviously, it's, I don't know if you notice, it's dominated by Spanish and Italian riders. <laughs> well, the amazing, the amazing part about this is, is, well, there's a longer race season in those countries than we have in Canada. So I'm not yeah. too surprised we don't have any competitors. Uh, but the other thing is, is it's sort of like soccer. You know, it's very expensive to go even top level kart racing. Yeah. Um, and after you, after you're done kart racing in, in four wheel, um, it just gets obnoxious, obnoxiously expensive. If you don't have a sponsor, you're done. And I mean, you have to have a sponsor when you're 13 years old, 12, 13 years old. Yeah. Um, however, with motorcycles, it's a little bit different. And I know some friends that have kids that have raced motocross. Yeah. which is a completely different thing. And it's not cheap, no. but it's attainable, you know, because it's two wheels. So you can, you can still do this. And so I can yeah. see how, you know, it, it, um, it's a little bit broader base with and easier to, to do with motorcycles, with two wheels. It's, they're easier to fix too, right? Like mm -hmm. they're simpler and machines. Yeah. Right. Right. So, all right. So that's it for these first two races. Uh, next they're in... Argentina, that's coming mm -hmm. up uh, in a couple of days, actually, from when we're recording this. And so uh, we'll look forward to that. We'll talk to you soon, John. Thanks, Rob. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.